you all for joining us. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. First thing, first thing first, we are going to record this meeting. So, of course, if you don't want to be um, captured on camera, then um, you can always turn off your video. Um, so thank you for joining us this evening, and I'm looking forward to an interesting and informative discussion about Initiative 83. This would allow ranked choice voting and open primaries to independent voters in DC. Uh, we have until eight, so I will provide an introduction. Each of our panelists will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll go into the Q&A period. And please put your questions into the chat as you have them, because we're going to use them for the Q&A. So I am Anne Stauffer, and I'm the Vice President for Issues and Advocacy here at the League. Um, and the DC League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. So we encourage voter participation and we advocate on policy issues. Uh, we do this based on League positions agreed to by our state League and those agreed to at National League meetings. The DC League has supported ranked choice voting since 2015 because we believe it assures that the candidate with the broadest support of the voters is elected. It provides, provides voters more voice in elections and leads to more representative government. We also support opening primaries to independent voters because as the League um, national position states, we encourage electoral methods that provide the broadest voter representation possible and are expressive of voter choices. So given this, we testified in support of Initiative 83 in front of the DC Board of Elections. Um, and as this initiative moves forward, we wanted to make sure our members and DC residents fully understand what the initiative will do and how it fits into the broader national context. So we are truly privileged to have three great experts to guide us. They all have a depth of expertise in voting policy and civil liberties. I will briefly introduce them and then post their longer bios in the chat. So Lisa Rice heads up Make All Votes Count DC, the proposer of Initiative 83. She is an ANC commissioner, a political strategist, and on the board of Unite America, among other organizations. Deb Otis is director of research and policy at Fair Vote, a nonpartisan organization focused on voting reforms that make democracy more functional and representative for every American. And Jeremy Gruber is the senior vice president at Open Primaries, which works to enact open primaries in all 50 states, DC, with my editorial aside, which should be a state, right? Okay. <laughs> and US territories. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, Lisa, please start us off by describing um, why you proposed Initiative 83 and what it would do in terms of DC's elections. That'd be great. Thanks. Thank you, Anne, and I'm really glad to be here. I um, appreciate the invitation and thank you to the members of the League of Women Voters. Um, and it, it, you know, this is this is what I do. I love to riff on, on election reform and uh, I love to talk about Initiative 83. Um, and you shared a little bit about, my, about me and I do want to get into the nitty gritty of what's proposed, but I also want people to know a couple of other things about me because some of the myths that were busting um, have to do with me and who I am. I was born and raised here in DC. I live in Ward 7. I've been voting as a DC voter since age 18. And uh, I'm the mom of a Ward 8 uh, DC public school teacher. Um, open primaries and ranked choice voting, which are the two electoral reforms proposed by the Make All Votes campaign, Make All Votes Count campaign, which now is officially uh, ballot initiative 83, is really going to help our democracy change evolve, grow, and become accessible for many more of us. And um, I think that's a really important place to, to sort of pause and, and, and really absorb that right now, the elections are not accessible to all of us. And that's where I'll start with open primaries because open primaries really matters to us, to independent voters. And I am one of 86,000 who are disenfranchised here in DC. And we're really talking about voter suppression. It is a voter suppression issue. Um, one of the things that I think really makes this 
a perfect time to bring open primaries into the discussion is because during the last election cycle, our mayor, our council chair, and our delegate to Congress talk a lot about DC statehood. And one of the things that they talk about very, very passionately is that it's a voter suppression issue. And so what I say to them and to you, and to everyone is, let's clean up our backyard first. Let's start with these 86,000 of us, your neighbors, who are ineligible to vote in DC's most important election, the primary. And I'm barred from that because I don't belong to a political party. And like many people, I didn't know that we even had a choice. You know, when I, I was talking to some folks yesterday and I said, you know, as, a, as an 18 year old, when I registered, I didn't even know that you could register as anything other than Republican or Democrat. Let me tell you, 18 year olds now, they know, and they are registering as independent. So, you know, if our DC voter registration aligns with the national trends, over 50% of our young people in that 18 to 30 age range are registering as independent. And we risk losing an entire generation of voters if we don't accept them and expand the franchise to include them. And, um, you know, open primaries, I think, also matter matters to the candidates. Um, our closed primaries really discourage changing, change agent candidates who might appeal to those 86,000 voters. And um, our single choice elections discourage first time and diverse candidates who fear or are told that they might split the vote and very often are told to wait their turn. These single choice elections also mean that poor performing candidates can nearly be guaranteed that even if they barely eke out a narrow slice of the Democratic primary vote, which is sometimes as low as 17% of voters show up for primaries. I think we had a peak of about 30, 35% of the electorate show up for primaries. But when you, when you start slicing and dicing the math, what we have is people who are in office today, hold people who are in the council today, who literally were put on that general election ballot with 10, 12% of the vote. You know, if it's somebody who got 30% in the primary, they that's that's 10% of the electorate because so few vote. So open primaries is really, really important issue. And I think that our our leadership knows it because they wouldn't be talking about it on a national stage. And so, you know, let's bring it home and and, and start at home. You know, ranked choice voting and Deb will speak to numbers much more eloquently nationally than I will, but I'll talk a little bit about how I feel, which is ranked choice voting gives candidates the opportunity to campaign in a new way because they have to campaign to more of us. They need to win 50% of the vote in order to go to the next step. And so that means we'll be rewarded with politicians who work hard for our support. And, um, you know, that's that's really, really important. We have found, many of us in D.C., that our politicians don't seem to be accountable to most of us. They're accountable to their small base. And ranked choice voting is a proven system, empowering the voters, giving more genuine choice in elections, and tends to elect more women and people of color. And that's some myth busting I want to do because we will hear often that the exact opposite, but the data does not support it. Um, I want to touch on something also that we hear in DC, and I wanted I want us to have a really frank discussion about this. A lot of times, naysayers try to claim that ranked choice voting is too complicated, especially for someone like me a senior black who is living east of the river. So what I want to say is don't believe it. You know, it's a dangerous trope. It's degrading. It's archaic and it's insulting. And it's a fear-based tactic 
And it, that's simply untrue. As adults, every single day, we rank and choose things every day in our lives all the time. I'm quite capable of doing that. Other seniors are quite capable of doing that. And just because we live east of the river doesn't mean we aren't capable of doing that. And I address that um, straight up and head on because sometimes it's difficult for us to talk about these tropes and, and what that does to the psyche of the collective psyche of those of us who live east of the river. We be, some of us begin to believe that. And I'm telling you, it's just not true. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch upon is why combine the two, because I've been hearing a lot about why, why, why combine the two. So um, I'll start out with where we wanted to go, which is final five voting, which has open primaries, fully open primaries, and then the top vote getters go to a ranked choice general election. DC's home rule charter prevents us from pursuing that model because the home rule charter demands that we have partisan elections. So the next best thing that we think we can come up with is this combination of opening the primaries to registered independent voters and ranked choice voting in both the primary and the general elections. And again, I talk about how these things combine making our elected officials accountable to us. And I deeply, deeply believe that. Um, I, I talk about that voter suppression and I, I want it to end, you know, the time, it's past time to end that. And, uh, you know, that's my pitch. I'm gonna, I know I'm, uh, I'm my time is, oh, I went over time, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but uh, that's that's what I that's how that's how I'll start and uh, let. I'm not sure who comes next, but I'm done. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Deb, if you want to pick up the ranked choice voting uh, piece, that would be great. Thanks. Hi. Uh, thanks, Anne, um, and thanks for having me here. Um, so my name is Deb, and I work for Fair Vote. So we are a nonprofit that advocates for ranked choice voting and also educates about ranked choice voting. Uh, and so it's an interesting position to be doing research in, in service of an advocacy mission, right? Um, the organization supports ranked choice voting, but it's also my job as the lead of our policy and research department to figure out what's true, to figure out how ranked choice voting is actually working in practice. Is it uh, fulfilling its promises? You know, what, what's good and what are the areas where it might be falling short? Uh, and so I've been asked to do, uh, to kind of chat about what we're seeing around the country in ranked choice voting, kind of bring that national perspective and also address a couple of these specific myths and concerns that people are hearing about. Um, so I did prepare slides. Uh, so I will go ahead and pull that up and share my screen. And then I will do a, do a presentation here, including addressing a couple of concerns. And then hopefully you all will have plenty of questions. Um, and after Jeremy shares as well, we can dive into those. Okay, uh, I am sharing my screen here. So I will go ahead and put this into presentation mode. All right, so we are talking about ranked choice voting working in practice. We're gonna look at the evidence here. So I'll be able to skip through, go through a couple of these slides pretty quickly. Um, you know, there's definitely a growth narrative. It's the reason that we've all heard of ranked choice voting. Uh, the reason that the league has that the DC League has supported this for years is because it is growing fast. And so we have enough evidence now to see what the impacts are in practice, to see how it's actually working. Uh, it's reaching uh, 13 million voters around the US in two states and 50 cities and territories. And I, you know, I think you all probably kind of know some of this narrative. So I'm gonna just gonna speed on through and get to the really good stuff that might be new or extra interesting tonight. Uh, so how does it work? it lets voters rank their preferences. The ballots are typically a grid ballot like you see uh, on this in this image and the DC ones would likely look similar to this but let you rank five choices. Um, we'll quickly go through how the ballots are counted. 
for when you're electing one person. I think folks on this call are probably familiar with this because we are so happy to have had the league as a supporter for years, but we'll do this anyway, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, first up, they count just everyone's first choices. And so this is round one where we've only counted first choices. We are looking for a majority winner. Uh, as Lisa said, in our current elections, our, the old style of elections, we often elect people who don't have half of the voters support, but that should be the lowest bar. If you're gonna represent us in our democracy, you need at least half of the voters to support you being there, that's the point. Uh, and so if we count up first choices and there's no majority winner, like in this example, then this is not enough. We need, we need the instant runoff to get a majority winner. So we eliminate the last place candidate. That's, that's gonna be Darius in last place here. People who voted for that candidate have their ballot count for their second choice. It's like a runoff, but you do not have to go and show up again. You already marked on your ballot. If my top choice doesn't make it, who do I who's who do, who am I going to support among the candidates who are still standing? So when we eliminate that candidate, transfer those ballots, we see they transfer to the other active candidates. I kind of tried to mimic a uh, two-party system here, so that you know that was a candidate from kind of the orange faction. A lot of those votes transferred to the other orange candidate, but some cross parties. Uh, in DC, of course, the primaries are what what's going to matter. So think of this as as maybe factions within within a primary rather than rather than two different parties. So here we are. We're on round two. We don't have our majority winner, so I eliminate the last place candidate. Transfer Carla's ballots, and here we go. Now somebody has crossed the fifty percent threshold. Uh, so. In this case, it was the same person who was in the lead. And actually that happens most of the time in ranked choice voting. A any guesses as to how often it happens that the first round leader goes on to win? Put it in the chat, unmute, any guesses? I love an interactive. Well, I'll tell you, we're slow to guess. Um, 65% is a guess. It's more often than that. It's more like 85%. If there's a first round leader, they usually go on to win because first round support generally is a good metric of how well someone is connecting with voters. But that 15% of the time when you get this come from behind win, those are the cases where we where we really need ranked choice voting. That happens for a very good reason. Uh, and so even when it doesn't change the winner that often in practice, it changes everything else. And I think Lisa talked with you talked about this as well. This changes who can run. You know, folks don't have to worry about being told to stay out of the race, wait your turn, that you might just split the vote with a similar candidate. Folks don't worry about that. You can enter the race, you can run, connect with voters. Uh, and this changes the tone of campaigns, more positive campaigning. So even when the first round leader goes on to win most of the time, they're coming out of a more positive voter focused process. And so some people are disappointed thinking, oh, it doesn't upend the winner that often. Well, it upends the winner when it matters and it, it creates a better campaign all along. So since it's my job to share the data, we'll do a couple of these. What are we actually seeing around the country? Um, voters are saying they like RCV in places that use it already. Uh, one vulnerability, the, the polling in places that don't use it yet is often not quite as positive. Uh, but once people have used it once, even after the first time, they say, oh, this was amazing. I never want to go back. Uh, ranked choice improves representation. Lisa did touch on this. Um, this elects more women and candidates of color. You get more of those folks running and winning. Um, over the last decade, we have women winning half of municipal RCV races, which is about the same as women's share of the population. But if you look at non-RCV cities, you are not at 50%, you are not at parity. Uh, and then we have lots of examples, uh, like in New York City, Salt Lake City, um, Las Cruces, New Mexico, where uh, women and candidates of color are making up the majority of legislative bodies for the first time in history in those cities. Uh, and so we're seeing very positive outcomes in practice in terms of representation. Uh, ranked choice elects winners with broad support. Uh, the vast majority of people get the winner is one of their top three choices. So that's more voters who gave like an opt in. Yes, I'm OK with this person to the winner. So these are engaged voters who now have some skin in the game because that person who won, they go look up results the next morning. Oh, yeah, I did vote for that person. They were my second choice. And lastly, 
this positive campaigning. Uh, there is evidence in practice. Uh, there's There are research studies that look at campaign statements, like what candidates say in debates and what kind of campaign videos they put out to kind of try to analyze this, how positive is the campaign, how issues focused is it? Uh, and there is evidence that ranked choice is improving that. And so that's good for voters. And so these are the positives. Um, there are a couple of places where ranked choice is not really making a lot of positive change on its own because no one solution is going to be the silver bullet to fix everything. Um, the question of voter turnout and ranked choice voting is still kind of mixed. And it, it mostly, based on my read, it looks like ranked choice on its own probably doesn't really impact turnout that much. This is a question of ballot style. This is not going to make someone turn up or not turn up. Um, and so this is why I love the DC initiative so much because it, it combines ranked choice with the open primaries that I think can ha really have that turnout effect. Um, so I think this is a really good case of combining policies to make up for where this one policy on its own can't do everything. So I think this is great, uh, the DC combination here. Um, I wanna talk about kind of the sticky question of does everyone participate equally in ranked choice? You know, Lisa brought this up as well. We are hearing from opponents that voters in some neighborhoods are not gonna be able to use ranked choice voting well. Um, and there's a particular point of evidence that, that folks are bringing up to, to say ranked choice voting is gonna disenfranchise voters. And my research points to the opposite. And, and so I want to dive into this. This is this gets really into the nitty gritty, but this is an argument that we're seeing a lot from the opposition, and I want to be able to confront it head on tonight. Um, so in D.C., like across the country, we have disparities in voter turnout. Um, and so, it, you know, wards seven and eight in D.C. have the lowest voter turnout. Uh, but even beyond that, in the uh, at-large city council race, that's the one where we all get to vote for two. In Ward 7 and 8, there's a higher rate of just voting for one, not using both of those vo votes, just voting for one. I, I call that bullet voting. And so you might you might hear this from the opposition that, well, if, you know, voters in Ward 7 and 8 tend to bullet vote now when they have the choice to vote for two, they're not. And so if you give them a ranked ballot, then they'll they won't rank. They'll just vote for one and that will make things worse. That'll worsen the disparities that already exist. Uh, my research says that's not what's going on and that's that's missing a key part of the story. So I want to dig into what I'm seeing uh, and maybe uh, hopefully help explain what's going on here. So I, I came at this question a couple of different ways and was lucky enough to work with Lisa on some of this research. Um, my research suggests Bullet voting in DC in Ward 7 and 8 is likely an informed choice. It's not because voters don't know how to vote. It's an informed choice and it's a strategic choice. And so why is that? What are the two pieces that make me think that? Number one, we found that voters in Ward 7 and 8 have the highest participation rates in down ballot races. You know, everybody turns up and votes for mayor and there's always some a, a drop off for the down ballot races. Like fewer people are voting for city council, even fewer for school board. Well, in Ward 7 and 8, those voters are engaged. They are taking the right to vote seriously. They are using that franchise. They are participating in down-ballot races more. So those are educated, savvy voters. So that's one piece. Another piece, voters in Ward 7 and 8, uh, over the years that we studied, express more support for the Democratic nominees in general elections than in any of the other wards. Well, in the vote for two races, you only got one Democrat on the ballot. Everyone else is an independent or a Republican or some other party. And so they're voting for just the Democrat because there's a strong party preference. So the fact that we showed that these voters are really engaged and that they have a strong party preference, that explains why they're only voting for one when they have the option to vote for two. And so this idea that somehow ranked choice voting isn't gonna work for these wards, uh, I think, it's condescending for sure. And the data just doesn't hold that up at all. Um, I looked at some cities in Utah that recently switched from uh, vote for two to ranked choice voting. So exactly what DC is about to do. So I have a chart here. We love charts. Um, the purple bars are the rate of bullet voting before they switched to ranked choice voting. And so we're across these various Utah cities, it ranges from 9% to all the way to 32%. That's the dark purple bar pre-RCV. Then the red bar 
after they switched to ranked choice voting, how much bullet voting was there. So first up, very obviously, there's less. There's less bullet voting. Um, but I think more importantly, there's no correlation here. The, the cities that had a lot of bullet voting before ranked choice are not the same as the cities that had a lot of bullet voting after. Like the choice to bullet vote before and after are totally different choices with different considerations. And so next time someone says that to you, it's nonsense. Like this is a bad faith argument that voters are, that ranked choice voting is gonna worsen disparities and that some voters aren't gonna be able to handle this because of, because of their undervoting in other races. I think that is smart strategic behavior in the other races and it has nothing to do with RCV. So I think we can shut that one down. Um, the other point, I think I am low on time, so I will do one more. Uh, I was asked to talk about Arlington, Virginia. I'll bet some of you heard about this. They used ranked choice voting uh, for a primary election this past summer, and then they chose not to expand it and use it for more elections. So what happened there, uh, and is it relevant to what's going on in D.C.? So first up, their county board passed ranked choice for just one election. They passed like, well, we'll do a trial. We'll put it in just this primary election. After that election, we'll reevaluate. And so voters liked it. Voters used it. Um, they got a good mix of factions. Uh, this was within the Democratic Party primary. They were electing two. So that's going to feel familiar to D.C. people. They were electing two, but it was within a primary. Uh, and the key issue in the race was, was housing, whether to build more what, what's called missing middle housing. Uh, and voters were pretty split and their outcome was split. Like ranked choice voting did a good job. It elected one person from the like pro missing middle housing camp and one from the stop the missing middle housing camp. Uh, and so it did its job and voters liked it, but the council chose not to expand it. I'm gonna skip this up. So a month after the primary, this came up before the council. Hey, do we want to pass this for the general election? And they chose not to. So why not and what happened? Uh, first, of all, first of all, there is still support. I mean, I think they're going to use it for primaries again. But we got a quote here from their uh, county board chair. This is, I have this guy's name. Pop that up. There we go. Um, and so this person says that they see it as right and proper for the primary, but maybe not for the general election. And it, it might be coming back for primaries in Arlington. And so the county board there that passed it is all Democrat, five members, they were all Democrats. And they wanted to use it in the primary really as a party strengthening tool, because this got them strong nominees, really representative to good, strong representative Dem nominees that they could advance into the November election. And now going into November, they got their great nominees. This is de Democrats being Democrats. Come on. We're, they're want to make sure that not to change the system when they've, they've gotten the party strengthening out of it that they want. Um, I think this is probably smart politics, but it looks bad up here in DC to see this happen in Arlington. Um, and, you know, it, they knew the nominees already. And so maybe it would have been a little weird if they did adopt RCV for the general after kind of being halfway through election season. Um, and so, you know, this this would not have been my choice. I would have liked them to use it for the general, um, but they chose not to. It's going to stay as uh, primaries only in Arlington. Uh, of course, here in DC, it will be used for both. So I'm wrapping up. This is my last slide. This is just a refresher on what it's being used for and how. So party primaries will use it, but independent voters get to participate. And so the parties will choose their nominees with ranked choice. It'll be in general elections for one seat, and it'll be in the multi-winner general elections. Uh, when you're electing two people, you just eliminate the last place candidates, just like we've already seen. You do it until there are two left, and those are the two winners. So that's how it's going to be used in D.C. There are a couple of other ways to do it, but that's the, that's the D.C. proposal. Uh, and we'll use it in presidential primaries, which I'm excited for because those are big, crowded fields. I want to rank. Uh, okay. That is my time, that's my presentation. And so I will hand the mic back, thank you. Thanks, Deb. Well, I think it's fairly obvious. Uh, Jeremy uh, is uh, next to talk about open primaries and what that means um, nationally and then in DC. 
Thanks. Great. Hi, everybody. Let me uh, set mine up too, and we'll get going. All right, everybody see that? Okay. Um, again, my name's Jeremy Gruber. I'm the Senior Vice President for Open Primaries. We are a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization made up of a, a 501c4 and a 501c3. Uh, and we work on all aspects of primary election reform from enacting open primaries in states and cities that need them in defending open primaries in states and cities that require it. Uh, we work to educate, we work to organize, we advance litigation. We work with both the grassroots and the grass tops uh, to reform our primary elections. I thought it was important to start first off is, why do we have primaries? Um, there's a lot of misinformation about what primaries are and why we have them. So I thought it was important to go back to the beginning. 100 years ago, we didn't have primaries. So 100 years ago, what would happen is, as a voter, the only time you got a chance to participate in the election process was in November in the general election. And over a period of time, voters became more and more angry, more and more uh, upset about the experience of showing up in November after a, a long election season and having all the choices having been made for them because the party insiders, the special interests would get together in the proverbial smoke-filled uh, back, back rooms and they would choose candidates, they'd select agendas, they would pick the issues that would be the focus of the campaign. And by the time voters showed up in November, there wasn't much to talk about. So primaries were a voter-centric uh, reform passed in the early 20th century in order to bring voters into the political electoral process at the very beginning to choose candidates to set agendas, to be part and parcel of the entire election season of decision-making all the way through uh, to the general election. Now, there's a lot of different types of primaries in use uh, across the country. I'm gonna go very quickly uh, over them, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the appropriate time. 38 states uh, have some form of an open primary already. 20 states have a particular form of open primary. These are states that are primarily in the South, but not exclusively, that combine nonpartisan voter registration. So in these states, you don't actually register as a Republican or a Democrat, unlike Washington, D.C. You register as a voter. And as a result, uh, every voter gets to pick a party ballot. They still have party primaries, but every voter, because you are not technically a Republican or a Democrat in these states, everybody picks a primary uh, ballot. Then there are uh, the system that is most similar to what is being debated in Washington, D.C. right now. States with partisan voter registration, you register with an affiliation, uh, and independent voters and only independent voters in these states can choose one party ballot or the other. If you're a Republican, you have to stay with the Republican Party ballot. Democrat, you have to stay with the Democratic Party ballot. Two of these states just in the last few years have adopted this model, Colorado in 2016, Maine uh, just last year. Actually, the effort in Maine for the semi-open primary was, was largely led by the Maine League of Women Voters. So there's been, the League of Women Voters have been, both state and city chapters have been uh, strong, strong coalitional partners in a lot of the reform around open primaries around the country. Uh, then there are a number of states that have open party primaries. In these states, quite frankly, in any state, a party has the unilateral right to decide to open its primary. The Supreme Court has said so. It's a freedom of association. Um, and uh, every election year, parties have the opportunity to notify this, their state legislature. They want to hold an open primary. Um, these are the locations where they're currently open. Um, these are actually all Democratic uh, primaries that are open. In the past, there have been Republican uh, states that have voluntarily opened their primaries as well. And then, of course, what you may have heard about quite a bit is the, the most recent form of open primary, the nonpartisan open primary that's in place in four states, 
um, California, Washington, Alaska, and Nebraska. In the nonpartisan open primary, you no longer have a Republican primary or a Democratic primary. You get rid of party primaries. You simply have a nonpartisan primary where you have one ballot. Everybody's on the ballot with their affiliation. Um, in the case of California, Washington, and Nebraska for their state legislative races, the top two go forward to the general election. In the case of Alaska, it's the top four. And then, of course, there's a dozen states um, that have partisan registration and closed primaries. So in these 12 states, uh, if you are anyone other than a Republican or a Democrat, you are completely shut out of the first round of elections in those states. Now, this is a, a really important statistic. 85% of American cities already use open nonpartisan elections where all voters can vote. So Washington, D.C., at the if you're apples to apples, if you're looking at the city level, Washington, D.C. is actually an incredible outlier in having closed primary elections. The vast majority of cities already hold open primary elections, uh, including 23 of the, of the 30 largest cities. St. Louis um, is the most recent major city to adopt an open primary. They went from a closed partisan primary to a nonpartisan primary. Um, in 2020. Now, there's two big reasons why we're talking more and more these days about primaries and why we need to you know, open versus close. The whole debate over primaries has become incredibly elevated over the last few years. Well, there's two major reasons why. First and foremost is the growth of independent voters. 60 years ago, almost everybody was a registered Republican or a Democrat. Today, independent voters are the largest group of voters in the country. They are the largest or second largest group of voters in almost every state. And that's putting a huge amount of pressure on a system that has focused for many, many years as if everybody was a Republican or a Democrat and promoted uh, elections in that model. And right in Washington, D.C., as Lisa mentioned, there's over 86,000 independent voters. That's 16 percent of all registered voters, and they are the second largest group of voters in the city, shut out of participating in the primaries. Who are independent voters? Well, they're all of us. I'm an independent voter. Lisa's an independent voter. They're a cross-section of all of us, but there's a few groups that really stand out um, among independent voters. As Lisa mentioned earlier, young voters. Well over 50% of young voters uh, are registering independent. It used to be when I was growing up, you joined the party your parents were a member of. No longer we're seeing a seismic break from young people who are leaving the parties in droves and registering independent. Something most people don't realize, veterans. Over half of our veterans, military veterans, are registered independent. Um, they like, like Rocky Blyer, who's a great Pittsburgh Steeler, um, uh, Super Bowl winner and uh, Purple Heart winner from uh, Vietnam likes to say, when you go as a veteran to fight, you don't fight for the red team or the blue team. You fight for the red, white, and blue team. Many veterans come back from their service um, without a strong uh, desire to join one party or the other. And then growing numbers of people of color. Uh, over a third of Latinos almost half of Asian Americans, a third of African Americans, growing numbers of people of color are going independent. One interesting statistic I just learned the other day, the largest group of independents in the city of Philadelphia, for example, a new study came out, the largest group were young black voters in the city of Philadelphia. So what is the uh, second uh, uh, sort of seismic change that is leading to this focus on primaries? Well, it's the total collapse of competition in our general elections. Around the country, our general elections are becoming less and less competitive. So all the decision-making, all the meaningful choices are really happening in the primaries. And I wanna show you, I'm sure many of you know this intrinsically, but just very what this looks like just in Washington, DC. If you look at, at the 2022 general election, 80% of all races were either uncontested or virtually uncontested. And if you look at the statistics, virtually uncontested meaning that the gap between the first and second place winner was so large that they were really just a, a nominal competition. 
Um, this is unfortunately not unusual or specific to Washington, D.C. In many, many uh, states and localities around the country, um, you, you, you see up to half of races uncontested. You tend to see less than 10 percent of races competitive. The primaries are where all the action is. So again, why open primaries? Well, closed primaries, when you have a closed system and you're shutting out voters, you're rewarding the small group of partisan loyalists that participate in the primaries. They call the shots. And when you have an uncompetitive general election, like I just described, our elected leaders know that in order to stay elected and, and be in office, they have to listen to that small group of party loyalists. Um, and it, it limits uh, the, the voices that they listen to and are accountable to. Closed primaries shut out young voters, independent voters. They reduce voter participation, which I'll get to in a second. What, do, what happens with open primaries? Well, shockingly, when you let everybody vote, more people vote. Voter participation goes up. Politicians are accountable to a wider uh, number of their constituents because they're not just um, having to listen to their party faithful, but to a wider uh, cross-section of, of, of uh, voters. That makes them more accountable it makes them um, a better uh, able to listen to and be responsive to the desires of their constituencies when they're elected. And it ends, and this is perhaps one of the most important points we could say today. These party primaries are not, they are not private elections. They are taxpayer funded elections. We pay for them and we have always paid for them. And that's why when you look a hundred years ago, um, how primaries came up. That's why we pay for them, because they were never designed to be exclusive party elections. They were always designed to be open to voter participation. They are taxpayer funded. That's why the experience of when you go to vote in the primary, you're going into the same uh, uh, public places you go for the, to vote in the general election on the same machines with the same poll workers. It's administered um, by the same uh, uh, election administrators, the entire thing is paid for by you, the taxpayer, and yet many taxpayers are shut out. Now, just a quick note, uh, a big report that just came out from the Bipartisan Policy Center just uh, this March showing with unequivocally that states with open primaries have higher voter turnout. When you open the primaries, when you let more people in, more people participate. We, we're seeing an explosion of, of primary campaigns all around the country. All different types of open primaries, like I described at the beginning of the presentation, are happening all over the country. I'm happy to go into more detail if folks have any specific questions about those. Um, that's the end of the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elevate some questions from the chat if we're ready for that. Um, so uh, Vanessa asks, playing devil's advocate, this uh, moving to, I think, believe really this is the open primaries. This seems to undermine the two party system in D.C. Why not have an independent primary? How does this impact voter behavior in national elections? And maybe Jeremy and then Lisa could attend to those that question. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it doesn't affect it at all. If you look, the vast majority of, of, of cities, the vast majority of states already have open primaries. Uh, it doesn't affect uh, the parties at all. The parties are as powerful and, and, and they retain the ability that they've always had to, to uh, bring together like-minded voters, to field candidates, um, to develop agendas. It doesn't change the, the power of the party at all. It does one simple thing. It allows voters in to... Uh, into an election they pay for, and that is the most determinative election of the elected leaders that will lead them moving forward. That's it. Uh, it's a simple but very profound um, democratic, with a small d, democratic fix, um, and it has not affected uh, the parties in the least in their ability to do all the great things the parties do uh, uh, but they don't allow what they don't allow parties to do is to be the gatekeepers of public elections. And these are public elections. We believe that as long as they are taxpayer funded, that the taxpayers, all the taxpayers should be allowed in. 
Thanks, uh, Jeremy. Thanks. Is it Vanessa? Is it, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, this doesn't undermine the two party system at all. And one of the things that I um, like to talk about, and I don't often start with this, but since we're into it, um, you know, I'm paying for these elections. And so I should be able to participate. I am a registered voter here in DC. If the Democratic Party doesn't want me to play, then here's what I recommend they do. Go private, pay for their elections, their primaries themselves through caucuses. But as long as the parties are demanding that, that all of us pay for them, then all of us should be able to vote in them. It's really that simple. And I saw the second part of the question was about an independent primary, and I'm not sure what that means. Um, so if we could. Maybe maybe we could just ask you all to, you to speak a little bit to what are the nature of independence, right? Is it, are people registered as independents in DC or is it just a lack of registration for a party? Okay, so um, and you register as an independent. That's an active choice on your part. And that is how it happens in DC. If you, you can't, you can't, you don't default into being independent. You have to check a box or you're not registered to vote. And independent on old, for older school um, registrants, uh, before I can't remember what year, but it it says NA non affiliated or no party or no party affiliated. It depends, but it it simply means that's my active choice. I choose to, and the choices I believe are Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green. I believe Green still appears as a choice, and that um, those are the choices. If you leave it blank, then you're not registered to vote in DC. There are places and Nevada is one of them where if you leave it bl blank, it defaults to independent, but that is not how our automatic voter registration works here in DC. If someone leaves it blank when they are registering to vote, then they're not registered to vote. So they have to make that active choice. And as far as where independents are on the political spectrum, we're everywhere. We are all across the political spectrum. Um, so, you know, that's what makes us spicy and lovable. <laughs> you know, one thing I did want to add to back going back to the political question, because I think it's an important thing to consider is that in a lot of cases, there's been a huge gap between party leadership on this issue and the rank and file membership who are, who are widely supportive of open primaries. Um, and I would, I, I would suggest the following, that there, there's a certain fact that is occurring in American politics today. That is, is that the largest group of voters today are independent voters by far. And it's the fastest growing group of voters. And it's well over half of our young people the up and coming next generation voters, which has already surpassed baby boomers as the largest group of voters in the country. So I would suggest that any political party that wants to get stronger should be embracing open primaries because this is how you build your relationship to the largest group of voters in the country, for all the young people that are coming up. This is how you build your muscle to being a party that's going to last for the next hundred years is by building bridges. The more that you hold back, try to hold back what is inevitably happening in this country. And that is a move from party membership to independent status. You are determining, you are pushing your party back into the past rather than allowing it to break free and build the type of alliances that will pull it way into the future and have a long, uh, a long journey of success as a result. Yeah, thanks. Actually, and if I just, I mean, I'm looking at the question that says, why not have an independent primary? I mean, independent voters aren't looking for a third party. They're just not affiliating with the two existing parties. And I think that's that's another important um, 
But, I mean, that's how I would interpret that, right? There, there's, it's, this is not a third party movement going on in this country. Um, so we have a um, uh, we have another question here, um, and I want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. So please, Mike, uh, speak up if I represent it incorrectly. The question is, do we expect that open primaries would leave candidates in the race longer? And he shares by the time the vote got to Maryland, and I'm I, this sounds like a national election, so that's, that's the part I'm not as clear on. By the time the vote got to Maryland in 2020, we we're down to only one active candidate. So I guess that would be not for a local election, but for a national movement of open primaries, would that have any effect on candidates' longevity on, the, on a national ballot, say, for the presidency? I think it might, I mean, this is a hypothesis. I think it might get parties to their nominees even faster, uh, which maybe is not what Mike wants to hear. Um, yeah, in, in DC, we also vote late in the presidential primaries, uh, if this is a, a presidential primary question. But it, 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 the parties have an interest in, in finding a nominee relatively quickly so that they can all sort of gather and start campaigning in the general election. But sometimes you see these deep inter-party divisions. Um, we're going to see that on the Republican side when they start voting for president in a couple of months. Um, and I think if independent voters got to join those national elections, I think they would they would pull things toward the center and toward the establishment rather than toward the fringes. So I would suspect that you might get a nominee faster and it would be someone with more broad appeal. Um, and so that doesn't do much for the states that vote late, uh, unfortunately. Right, we have quite a few more questions. So I'm gonna move us on onto this next one, which is asking, could this have an impact on gerrymandering? So I wanna make sure, I don't know what the this is, whether it's the ranked choice voting part or the open primaries or both, but does could this have an impact on gerrymandering? Yeah, on these reforms in general, Thank you, Carol, for clarifying. This is Carol's question. Well, I, I would say not directly, but indirectly it very well could. I, it, what you see, what I've seen around the country is that the cities and the states that are passing reforms are passing more reforms on top of those reforms. Once you start that engine, once the, the population uh, of a city or a state uh, starts to embrace reform. They don't want to stop with just one or two. They want to fix everything. Um, we saw that, for example, in Maine, which passed ranked choice voting a number of years ago and then passed open primaries last year. We see that reform uh, and a culture of reform um, leads to all kinds of places. I certainly on the open primaries issue, which sort of shares sort of a yin and yang with the, with the gerrymandering issue. It, it's all about making sure that every voter has an equal voice. Um, and, uh, and once you, you do that in one aspect, uh, of your election law, it puts that much more pressure to fix it in other aspects. And thanks, Jeremy, Carol. So what we see, and, and now I'm going to step out of my role as proposer of this, um, ballot initiative and sort of step into something I do on a, and look at. Uh, quite closely on a national level. So what we have here in America is a primary problem. We call it the primary problem where, for instance, the U.S. House, 83% of seats in the U.S. House in the last election cycle were considered safe. In other words, all the action was in the primary because it was safe by party because of the intensive gerrymandering. And so the combination of so few voters, 10, 11% of voters were turning out in these extraordinarily gerrymandered districts. Things like reforms like open primaries will invite those of us who are independents to play in those primary elections. Does that mean we will show up in greater numbers? 
I sure as hell hope so, but I don't have a crystal ball. Um, so opening primaries or having semi-open or semi-closed primaries doesn't necessarily impact gerrymandering itself, but in areas where the districts are heavily gerrymandered, the independents, depending upon how large a part they are of the voting population, could impact the primary results. I think I said that right. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. All right, so Vanessa has a follow-up question. She really wants to understand this and be able to speak to it to other people. So she says, why rank choice and not just straight open primary voting? Like, why is this combination the way to go? Why isn't just casting a single vote for a candidate not a solution? So she just kind of wants us to string together, re reinforce the connections between these two ideas. Well, I can always make a pitch for why to include ranked choice voting. Um, I think one of the issues we face in our DC elections and across the country is the problem of electing people who have only a small sliver of support. Yeah. So when we're doing a vote for one election, uh, that works pretty well if you just have two candidates. But as soon as a third candidate enters the race, do they start? They start siphoning votes from other candidates, uh, and then. In a three winner race, someone can win with as little as like 35% support. Uh, we have a lot of members of Congress right now who won with less than 50% support. They don't have broad support, even in their gerrymandered districts. Um, we have plenty of members on the city council here in DC that Lisa mentioned uh, who got on there without winning that broad majority support. You know, especially when someone retires and you get an open seat, you get eight candidates in that primary. The winner is going to have 25% support and it, it it's a democratic city. And so they're going to go on and win, even though 25% of primary voters voted for them. And that's a really small number of people. So that that's the problem that ranked choice voting tries to solve. It, it's based on this idea that you should elect a winner with 50% support or more. Uh, and so when you do the open primaries, then you're solving this problem of equal access. You're making it so everybody can show up and vote without extra barriers. But then once everyone shows up to vote, we also need a system that lets folks express their honest preferences and gets us a winner with broad support. Once everyone's at the polls, we need the right system to choose the winner. And so I think that's they're, they're solving different different problems in the whole in the whole chain of events. And so that's why I think they go well together. All right, we have another question from Carol again, kind of big following the implications here, would the ranked choice then vastly increase the power of independence? And there's a little bit of an assumption here. It seems Democrats would bullet Democrats and Republicans bullet Republican candidates. And I'm guessing this is in the general, since in the primary, you wouldn't be voting for all, all, all parties. With Maybe, parties. You, you know, in, in the general election, it seems likely to me that the Democrats gonna get more than 50% of first choices. And so in the general election, I think ranked choice voting for the single seat is probably not gonna matter that much because the Democrats gonna run away with it. It's gonna matter a lot in the primaries. It's gonna help make sure the Democratic nominee has really broad support since they're likely to go on and win. And it's gonna matter in the two winner races for the two seat at large city council um, where once again here, usually the Democrat wins one of those seats. And then who is filling that other seat? Uh, sometimes when your ballot has 25 names on it, it feels like a, throwing a dart across the room blindfolded, like who's going to win? I have no way of predicting. Um, and so ranked choice voting helps really find those consensus winners in those crowded races. And I think just to clarify, Deb, you're talking about, I mean, you're specifically talking to about the D.C. situation where the D.C. Democratic primary really determines the general election, right? And I, I would follow up and say, um, would it increase the power of independence? Possibly. It would certainly change the way the candidates campaign because they've got a whole group of people who have been disenfranchised and would love to hear from candidates. 
and would love to hear how they will be the better candidate for all of us, right? So when when independents join in and are able to vote in the primaries, then that's that's a part of the population that quite frankly, candidates in DC have never spoken to. They don't care about us because we don't count. Opening the primaries changes that. You know, there was an interesting study um, done uh, looking at independent Latino voters and uh, in, in closed primaries. And what they found um, is that when, when that location opens the primaries, participation doesn't just go up in the primary, it goes up in the general. That in closed systems, they don't not only depress primary participation, because of course independents are completely barred from participating, but it also depresses general election participation because voting, and this, you know, I'm sure you're the League of Women Voters, you know this well, voting is a culture. It's, uh, it's a muscle. And if you're not exercising that muscle, like Lisa said, if there's not people reaching out to you politically, participating, interacting with you, working that, helping you work that muscle, um, then you, you are not going to be participating. So opening the system isn't just about getting access to the primaries. It's about creating a stronger culture of uh, voter participation throughout the entire election season, primaries and general. And, and I wanna, thanks Jeremy, I wanna follow up on that. Remember earlier in the conversation, we were talking about what's happening. You know, we got, we are, you know, you, you look back at history and go, I wonder what people were thinking when that big seismic shift happened. Well, we're in the time of a seismic shift right now. Our young people are saying, I want to vote on issues, not party. I want to vote for a person, not party. And therefore they are registering as independents. And so here we are, we, we, we want to vote and we should be allowed to vote. It is our constitutional right. And, you know, the time for the voter suppression, it's just done, you know, it's, it's, it's over. Thank you. We have, we have one more question, which Deb has responded to already in, in the chat, which is, is a goal of ranked choice voting and open primaries to produce better candidates? And Deb has responded basically saying, they may be better candidates, but really the goal is to produce consensus candidates of the populace. Any other reactions to that question? Well, I would say in addition to that, that it's also about accountability, right? It's about res responsiveness, right? When you get elected, your job is to represent the interests of your entire constituency, regardless of their political affiliation. That's your job as an elected leader. But in a closed primary system, it perverts that entire incentive structure because in the closed primary system, particularly because we have uncompetitive general elections. Our elected leaders know that in order to get elected and to stay in office, they have to be responsive, not to their entire constituency, not to every voter as we're sort of taught in civics class they should be, but rather to the small group of partisan voters in their party that vote in the, prim in the closed primary because those are the voters that are calling the shots. Those are the voters that are deciding whether or not they're actually gonna get elected in the primary and then move on to an uncompetitive general election and then on to office. So when you open a system, you create a broader uh, system of accountability and responsiveness between elected leaders and voters. It brings them closer together to the, in, in, a, in a way that, that we were, were, our democracy really envisioned, you know, when our, when our, uh, forefathers created in the first place, that type of relationship that has become less and less, more and more tenuous, less and less connected as a result of, of as Lisa said, the primary problem.
Well, there are no more questions currently in the chat. So I think I think we captured them all, but if we didn't, please have, I want that person to send me an angry chat and make sure I catch their missing question. <laughs> That's right. And as if, if, if there are, is an outstanding uh, question, Jess will catch it. But in the meantime, Lisa, I think it might be good as you know, we wrap this up. If you want to talk about what the next steps for the ballot initiative are. Sure. Thank you. Yes. So um, as you probably know, we went through the process of being deemed proper subject matter, which means we can appear on the ballot and in the summer, early fall, the language that will appear, the title, the language that will appear was presented and the Board of Elections has determined what that language will be. The next step is then for us to begin petition, petitioning, gathering signatures. Um, at the September meeting, I asked for an abeyance, which meant I asked for a delay in issuing those petitions. We want to have a long time to collect signatures and a couple of things were happening in the background that would affect the number of signatures that we would have to collect. And one of those was a cleaning of the voter rolls, which the Board of Elections was going through and is still going through. But they're getting clean. And what is happening is fewer people are registered voters. Fewer registered voters means we have to collect fewer signatures. So the next step is and it will not happen at, or did not happen at the October meeting. I'm not sure if it'll be November or December or January, we will appear on that agenda. And then we'll be, our clock will start ticking. We'll have 180 days to collect signatures. And you guys are gonna get tired of us because we're knocking on your door. <laughs> and we'll be at every metro station and we'll be at the grocery stores and we'll be, you know, collecting signatures. So we have 180 days to do that once, once the clock starts ticking, but we won't know until we, we just, we don't know, is that going to appear on the November, you know, or is it going to appear on December? I'm not oh, sure. So you don't know when you have to kick into gear, basically, it, at this point, exactly, right? Exactly. So I think one of the other thing that's going on is that DC, um, DC now passed a law that allows non-citizens to vote in local elections. And doesn't that change the registered voter count too? That will change the registered voter count as well. And I like to say that, gosh, if non-citizens can vote, can't I? Right. Well, I think it's I think it's a very interesting thing because I think DC, I mean, that's a very voter friendly, you know, I mean, DC tends to be I mean, a lot of DC's elect, uh, voting policies tend to be voter friendly. So like they have, we now we, we now will allow non-citizens to vote. So the, the question of se semi-open primaries is very relevant too. Yes. Um, yes, but yeah, so that's that's the next part. And if we if we achieve the proper percentage, which is 20% of registered voters, we get that number and then we'll be able to be on the ballot in, in November, uh, 2024. November 2024. Okay. Very exciting. Great. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thanks to our fabulous panelists. I learned a lot, actually. Uh, so I'm assuming everyone else on the call did as well. And I thought the questions were really, really helpful. Um, we've had a, a request for the slides, so we'll um, figure out how to also put those up on our website as well, or you know, make sure, um, because of course, as as this initiative moves forward, I imagine people will be looking for um, resources and information, um, which is why it's also, I'm glad that we recorded this uh, panel so that we can make it available to people who couldn't make it tonight, so. But thanks for everyone who did show up, who asked questions, who, was in, who were engaged, and um, again, thanks to our panelists. 
It was Thank great. you so much. Um, and I appreciate all the questions. Never too many questions. Never too many questions. So um, the person who asked a question and then needed clarification, love it. Absolutely love it. Thank you all so much. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks.